Joseph Desire Mobutu presided over the Congo from 1965 to 1997. As part of Africa's dinosaur generation, he became well known for his autocracy, corruption, nepotism and embezzlement, which ultimately left the Congo in economic ruin. Keep watching to learn more about one of Africa's most notorious autocrats. Please also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps our channel grow and allows us to make more videos like this one. In the tradition of African coup leaders, General Mobutu explained his reasoning for taking power in 1965 as preventing the Congo from descending into anarchy and corruption. The nation was at risk, he said, risk on all sides, both internally and externally. Restoring power to the central government in Leopoldville was Mobutu's main focus, and to do so he created a new Congo. Unfortunately, this meant that anyone who disagreed with him or caused disorder would be met with punishment. Before an assembly of 50,000 people, four former cabinet ministers were arrested on treason charges, tried by a military tribunal and publicly executed. Others followed. In only five years, Mobutu managed to bring some level of law and order back to the country. At first, Mobutu's economic strategy seemed successful. Inflation was halted, the currency was stabilized, output increased and the government's debts were low. The giant copper mining industry was successfully nationalized. In 1970, the international community's view of the Congo changed from one of ridicule and despair to that of a state with great potential. The United States saw Mobutu as a powerful tool to further their own interests in Africa. Since 1960, when the Congo became independent from colonial rule, Washington made it a priority to keep the country pro-Western and prevent any Soviet Union advances in Africa. For a while after his 1965 coup, Mobutu stayed on the CIA's payroll and regularly met with Larry Devlin, the CIA station chief in Leopoldville. Congo's political stability and vast natural resources, like copper, cobalt, and industrial diamonds attracted more foreign investors. And so its economy grew. Mobutu made a concerted effort to create an attractive investment environment. Washington provided more encouragement for Mobutu during his visit to the White House in 1970. Nixon talked highly of the Congo twice, emphasizing how it would be a great investment opportunity for the US. In the early 1970s, things looked promising for the Congo. The price of copper was rising rapidly, generating a lot of income for the government. Buoyed up by this new wealth, Mobutu launched a series of grandiose development projects, a steel mill near Leopoldville, a giant dam on the lower reaches of the Congo River at Inga, a long-distance power line from Inga to Katanga, an ambitious new copper mining project, new manufacturing plants and an array of infrastructure projects. By 1974, American and European financiers were scrambling to invest in the Congo, pledging more than $2 billion. The Congo's image had tremendously improved to the point where Muhammad Ali and George Foreman decided to have their 1974 rumble in the jungle there. As Mobutu's political ambitions developed, he also took steps to ensure that everyone adhered to his ideology. This included creating a national political party, the Movement Populaire de la Révolution MPR, of which he was the unchallenged leader. The political ideology was initially called Authenticite, but it was later renamed to just Mobutuism. Despite never being clearly defined, Mobutuism had the full force of law. Any act that strayed from the Mobutuist message was considered a constitutional offence. He gradually amassed great personal power, issuing decrees and controlling appointments, promotions, and the dispersal of government funds. In an attempt to forge a more national identity, he had many places renamed. For example, the Congo became Zaire, a name the Portuguese settlers created from the Kikongo word for vast river, Enzadi. The European names of towns were changed to local ones, for example, Leopoldville became Kinshasa, Elizabethville turned into Lubumbashi, Stanleyville Kisangani, and the province of Katanga was renamed Shaba. Zyrians with Christian names were told to switch them for African ones. Priests were alerted that if they baptized any Zyrian child with a name from Europe, they would be sentenced to five years in prison. Mobutu renamed himself Mobutu Sesi Siko Kuku Ngbendu Wa Zabanga. In his own Ngbendu translation, it meant, the warrior who knows no defeat because of his endurance and inflexible will and is all-powerful, leaving fire in his wake as he goes from conquest to conquest. 
The more succinct Chaluba translation meant, invincible warrior, cock who leaves no chick intact. With the same level of vigor, Mobutu banned Congolese men from wearing European suits. He replaced them with an order that they should wear a collarless Mao-style tunic instead, which was to be worn without a shirt or tie. This came to be known as abacost, a basler costume, literally meaning down with the suit. The abacost was Mobutu's personal trademark, which he often paired with leopard skin hats from a Paris couturier and thick, black-framed spectacles. The personality cult surrounding Mobutu became extremely pervasive. He gave himself grandiose titles, such as father of the nation, savior of the people, supreme combatant, and great strategist. The personality cult surrounding Mobutu became extremely pervasive. He gave himself grandiose titles, such as father of the nation, savior of the people, supreme combatant, and great strategist. Many songs and dances were created to praise his deeds, and officials even wore badges with his miniature portrait on them. Much of the adoration took on religious overtones. The television news began with the image of Mobutu, wearing a leopard skin hat, appearing to descend from the clouds. He was seen as a messiah in the Congo. Mobutu's next move was to personally enrich himself on a level that Africa had never seen before. In 1973, under the pretext of giving Zaire greater economic independence, he ordered the seizure of 2,000 foreign-owned businesses, including farms, plantations, factories, and retail shops. There was no compensation for those seized enterprises. Mobutu described his decree as a radicalization of the revolution, but instead of the state taking control of the enterprises, they were handed out to individuals as private property. The main beneficiaries were Mobutu and members of his family. Mobutu acquired 14 plantations that he merged into a conglomerate called Cultures et Elevages du Zaire, Selza. Selza's plantations not only produced one quarter of Zaire's cocoa and rubber output, but it also employed 25,000 people. This made Selza the third largest employer in the country, with 140 Europeans included in that number. His fortune rapidly increased throughout the 1970s. Every year, he funneled large amounts of money into his private bank accounts overseas. In 1976, one of the plantation companies he took over transferred $1 million to his Swiss bank account in a single transaction. According to the central bank, in 1977 approximately 50 Zairean companies controlled by Mobutu's close friends and family illegally smuggled $300 million out of the country via exports. By the end of the 1970s, Mobutu's net worth was in the billions, making him one of the richest men in the world. In fact, by the early 1980s his fortune had grown to an estimated $5 billion. He used much of his money to buy luxurious houses and estates, mostly in Europe. His properties included the Villa del Mar in Roquebrune Cap Martin on the French Riviera, an 800-hectare estate in Portugal's Algarve, and a converted farmhouse in the Swiss village of Savigny. He not only owned a large apartment on the Avenue Foch in Paris, but he also had nine buildings in Brussels ranging from office blocks to mansions and parklands. Furthermore, he had properties in Spain, Italy, Ivory Coast, Senegal, Morocco, and Brazil. His houses in Zaire were just as luxurious. For example, in Kinshasa he had a mansion on a hill that came with its very own zoo. He also enjoyed the use of a three-storied luxury boat, Camagnola, entertaining foreign dignitaries and visiting businessmen by taking them on trips along the river. His favorite residence was an enormous palace complex that cost him $100 million to build. He located it in the depths of the equatorial forest at Badalite, a small village 700 miles northeast of Kinshasa. He saw this location as his ancestral home. His grand palace there, with its huge marble-lined salons, spanned across 15,000 square meters of landscape dotted with ornamental lakes and gardens. A smaller second palace featured a discotheque, an Olympic-sized swimming pool and nuclear shelter. The rooms were also furnished with Louis XIV furniture, Murano chandeliers, Orbison tapestries and monogrammed silver cutlery. Badalite was known for its remarkable features, including luxury guesthouses, a hotel, and an airport that could accommodate supersonic concords, a plane often charted by Mobutu for his foreign trips. Furthermore, Mobutu requested that Badalite create model farms. These would be filled with Swiss cows and Venezuelan goats, brought in by airplane. About four or five times annually, 
Mobutu would descend upon Badalite with a large group of around 100 people. He would stay for several days, drive around in a grand procession, and then fly away again. As Mobutu amassed more wealth, Zaire quickly fell into crisis. Seizing foreign businesses turned out to be a terrible idea for Mobutu. Many quickly went bankrupt, some were simply stripped of their assets and abandoned, while others were ruined by incompetent management. The damage done to trade, farming, and business in rural areas was extensive. In 1976, Mobutu had to turn back his revolution and ask foreign owners to come back, but few returned. While this was occurring, the copper bonanza ground to a halt. After spiking to $1.40 per pound in April 1974, it rapidly decreased to 53 cents by 1975. By 1977, it had reached an all-time low. Zaire's exports in 1975 were worth only half of what they had been five years earlier, while the cost of oil and imported grain rose sharply. Zaire was instantly struck by inflation, fuel shortages, plummeting revenue and debts. In 1975, the Zaire government couldn't make payments on its $3 billion worth of foreign debt. To prevent financial collapse, Western bankers agreed to lessening loan repayments for some time. Zaire not only failed to meet its original payment schedule, but it also failed to adhere to the revised one. In 1977, the country's debt service payments equaled almost half of the government's total revenue. The banks had reached a point where they could not afford to let Zaire default on its debt, so they lent it more money in the hope that the government would eventually bring its finances under control. The grandiose development projects that Mobutu had launched years earlier were now also in decline, some teetering on the brink of collapse. The administration quickly fell apart. Corruption spread from the top, affecting every level of society. Many government services that were allocated a budget were never provided. Teachers and hospital staff went unpaid for months. Foreign bankers estimate that up to 40% of the government's operating budget is routinely stolen or diverted away from its intended purpose by civil servants and army officers. Around two-thirds of the 400,000 monthly paid civil servants were estimated to be fictitious. Their wages were simply being taken by higher-up officials. Army officers regularly kept for themselves their soldiers' pay and sold army food supplies on the black market. Furthermore, the soldiers set up roadblocks to confiscate farmers' produce going to market and demanded money from civilians. Air Force officers created their own air transport company, which undercut the rates of the national airline by more than half. Hospital medicines and equipment were sold by staff for their own benefit. Nothing could be accomplished without a bribe. Mobutu himself referred to the blight of corruption afflicting Zaire as Le Mal Zaiwa. Hypocritically, he relied on corruption to hold the system together and to keep himself in power. Moreover, he publicly condoned it. If you steal, do not steal too much at a time. You may be arrested, he told party delegates. Yibana male, steal cleverly, little by little. The plight of Zaire, after 10 years of Mobutu's rule, was pitiful. Hospitals closed for lack of medicine and equipment, deserted by staff unwilling to work unpaid. A fraction of the rural road network remained usable for motor traffic. Likewise, the river transport system was also in shambles. The level of employment was lower than it had been at the time of independence. Inflation made the employed barely earn 10% of what their salary was worth in 1960. Moreover, there were widespread cases of disease and hunger. 40% of Kinshasa's population lacked food to a point where they experienced severe malnutrition, according to relief agencies. The agricultural production in rural areas dropped sharply, with only 1% of the land being cultivated. Consequently, large food imports were necessary to feed the population. The state only served the interests of the rich, while regular folk had to fend for themselves. In 1978, foreign creditors forced Mobutu to agree to a series of corrective measures in despair at the chaotic state of Zaire's finances. Foreign officials were placed in key institutions such as the Central Bank, the Customs Department and the Finance Ministry. But this was to little avail. Government officials continued to find ways to circumvent any austerity measures. Corruption continued unabated. In order to maintain complete control, Mobutu heavily relied on a small group of officers from his own Ngbendi tribe who led special military and police units. Because these men were so crucial to his power, he paid them higher salaries and gave them other benefits as well. 
He kept ministers and senior officials in a constant state of flux, rotating them regularly, dismissing them or imprisoning them to ensure they represented no threat. Buying off dissidents was Mobutu's standard practice. But not all Mobutu's critics were willing to play the game. In 1980, 15 parliamentarians published a document totaling 51 pages that argued Mobutu was the cause of Zaire's problems and requested open elections. Mobutu's response was to arrest them and banish them to remote villages. Some subsequently decided to join his regime. Others held out. A group of determined dissidents, with Etienne Shisekedi wa Malumba as their leader, founded Union pour la Democratie et le Progrès Social in 1982. The government accused the dissidents of trying to overthrow it, so they put them on trial in front of the state security court. The court sentenced them to 15 years in prison but then released them after only one year. Shisekedi was arrested time after time again, ten times in eight years, but remained outspoken in his attacks on Mobutu, calling Mobutu both a malady and a kleptomaniac. In 1988, Shisekedi finally gave up his political career in exchange for freedom. Although Mobutu's regime had become oppressive and dishonest, he maintained the support of Western governments. His pro-Western, anti-Soviet beliefs won him favor in Western capitals, most notably Washington. Mobutu was a friendly tyrant in Washington parlance, meaning he could always be counted on to support Western interests over that of his own country. It was widely believed that the only options for Zaire were either Mobutu or chaos, a message which Mobutu himself effectively communicated. When rebels invaded Katanga from Angola in 1977 and 1978, Western governments, including the United States, France, and Belgium, as well as African partners such as Morocco were quick to come to Mobutu's aid. US aid to Zaire between 1965 and 1988 totaled $860 million. Mobutu sustained direct links to the White House through successive administrations. Despite winning plaudits in the West, his future leadership would eventually be brought to question. The seeds of his downfall would eventually be sown in the Rwandan genocide which began in 1994.